Hi guys and girls, I'm Reefman, and today we're gonna to talk about a paper about shipping coral uh, all the way from Singapore to London. This paper is called Maintaining Natural Spawning Timing in Acropora Corals Following Long Distance Intercontinental Transportation. It's by Jamie Craggs, James Guest, Aaron Brett, Michelle Davis, and Michael Sweet. The same group of people who did the earlier study that we talked about, about uh, breeding Acropora corals. And this study, or this paper, is actually an offshoot of the original one. Uh, this describes how they transported the corals from Singapore to their office in London. So most of the coral research that goes on, especially around breeding, is done on or in the reefs where the corals live. Very few has been done far away from the reefs because there's not much uh, studied uh, and published about how to actually transport Acropora corals long distances. So there are several different ways to do it. I think anyone who's ordered coral online, you've probably seen some different ways to do it. Uh, there's some companies that will just frag the coral and throw the frags into a bag. Um, others might put the frags into a little deli cup and then put the deli cup in the, the bag of water. Uh, others use a little piece of styrofoam to float the frag in water inside the bag. Uh, and their study actually used the styrofoam method where the coral colony is attached to a piece of styrofoam and the styrofoam is a little bit bigger than the coral colony and then they floated it upside down in the bag of water. So this is called the inverted submersion method of shipping coral and they were able to ship 14 large colonies of Acropora hyacinthus from Singapore to their offices in London with 100% survival rate 28 months after the shipment. When they were collecting the coral, they collected it about one month before the wild spawning time, because again, this whole study was about spawning of Acropora. So they collected it one month before the wild spawning time, and they made sure to space out their collection points across the reef, where each individual frag of the colony was no closer to its next one than eight meters. This way, the individual coral frags that they uh, collected were unlikely to be genetically related to each other. Um, for obvious reasons, when you're doing a breeding study, you want a wide variety of genetic material to start with. So they also buffered the water that they used in the transport to be about eight uh, or nine dKH alkalinity. And this uh, helped with overall pH of the water during the transport time. So the transport was done in two stages. They had one from the reef to a facility in Singapore, and then two from Singapore to London. The first stage they used just sort of normal kind of ocean water and they buffered it for pH and they used a, a different facility or different uh, water to get rid of some of the slime and mucus that's in the water. Anybody who's worked with Acropora at all knows that when you stress them, they produce a lot of slime. That slime is a great food for bacteria and bacteria in your shipping water is one thing that you don't want. So beyond just cutting out a frag off of the wild colonies, they also removed any visible microfauna that is on it. They got rid of any kind of algae, visible crabs, these kinds of things, so that they wouldn't be in the coral and potentially die and foul the water. They attached each colony with rubber bands, thin rubber bands, to the bottom of 25 millimeter thick styrofoam rafts, which were sized to be bigger than the colony itself. This way, when they're moving around in the water just from motion of shipping, the coral itself is not rubbing against the sides of the bag. The styrofoam raft is rubbing. This protects the edges of the coral from being worn down by the plastic bag itself. So after a 20 to 30 minute uh, floating period where they allowed the, the Acropora to slime up, they replaced the water with fresh water. This washed away another layer of slime and mucus so that there would be less food for bacteria in the water. The water itself was uh, about 27.5 degrees Celsius, 96% uh, dissolved oxygen, 7.97 pH, and alkalinity of 9 dKH uh, at the start of the transport. Um, they filled the remainder of the bag with pure oxygen. They didn't just use air. So they filled it with pure oxygen at a ratio of one part oxygen to two parts water, um, all the way up to one part oxygen to three parts water. I guess just depending on the size of the coral frag that they were transporting. As you might be familiar with, they put heat 
uh, little hand warmers, heat warmers, on the tops of the styrofoam coolers that all the bags were in. Uh, anybody who's ordered, um, I know at least Live Aquara, if you, if you order from the Diver's Den, they do similar things. You'll get them with heat packs in them. Um, Battle Corals also from uh, Colorado, they ship their coral that way. And they did this to maintain the temperature during the flight to the UK. Um, they used just a standard freight forwarder, so it could have been, um, I don't know, British Airways or who knows, some random airline that was used um, just sort of as a freight forwarder, no special shipment there. Um, they did find uh, that each individual coral, um, they, they stud checked the water when they arrived, uh, each coral had pretty stable temperatures, um, anywhere between 24 and a half at the low end um, up to about 26 and a half, um, 28, one at the end. So the, the heat warmers did a pretty good job of maintaining temperature. The salinity, as you would expect, there's not much evaporation over a 32-hour uh, uh, shipment. So the salinity was pretty standard, 32.2, um, 32.1 uh, parts per thousand. Um, the pH did drop quite a bit in all of them. Um, remember, it started around 7.9. Um, it ended around 6.9, and um, looks like 6.9 three is the low and the high is only about 7.15. So the pH does drop quite a bit in that shipping time. The dissolved oxygen on the other hand, uh, keep in mind that the normal atmospheric oxygen I think is like 20%. Uh, so at 100% oxygen, there's gonna be a lot more oxygen available into the water. And uh, as you would expect, the oxygen rate went up quite a bit. Um, it ended anywhere between 123% of where they started, all the way up to about 300% of where they started at. So the oxygen definitely increased quite a bit over the course of the shipment. So after 34 hours of shipment time, they received the shipment at their lab in, uh, at the Hornman Gardens uh, in London. And they unpacked everything, checked all the water, got the, the information that I just shared with you, and then they zip tied basically the coral from uh, the bags uh, they took it off of the styrofoam and zip tied it to live rock for placement into their research system. Uh, one of the coral looked particularly pale uh, and the water actually looked brown from all of the zoanthal algae that they uh, expelled. And this one coral, they did not acclimate. They just took directly out of the bag and you know, fearing for the, the brown muddy water, they took it out of the bag and put it directly into their research system um, without a lengthy acclimation. The rest of the coral, they acclimated over about two hours just with drip water or drip uh, acclimation um, as you would normally uh, with your corals at home. They waited two days to feed the coral. I thought that was interesting. Um, one day after they received the coral, they started to see polyp extension. The second day, they fed them. And this is the same thing that they fed their research systems in general. Um, they used yeast, acropower, uh, live phytoplankton, which was a tetracelmus, uh, live artema, and also a frozen uh, brachionis pulcatilis, um, which, uh, you know, I'm sure we could look those up and find them online. Um, they took their sump offline for two hours, added this mix of food, and then uh, waited for the coral to feed. After two hours, most of it was gone, indicating that the coral had fed on it. They turned their sump back on, started protein skimming, that kind of stuff again. So they did find that it took about two months of this uh, feeding regimen to get the coral to look visibly uh, pigmented as it would in the wild. So two months of recovery time there just to recover from the zoanthella allergy that the coral had lost during shipment. Um, they also found that one of the coral had a uh, sort of like coral uh, tissue loss uh, syndrome. They called it, um, let's see, what did they call it? Oh gosh. Um, they called it white syndrome, which is, what. Well, in the, the sort of a aquarium hobby we might call um, like slow tissue loss or slow tissue necrosis. Um, it's actually a bacterial infection. And so what they did was they removed the section of the coral that was uh, damaged uh, or infected and they left, and this is important, they left a banner of healthy coral tissue around it. One of the things that you can do and is recommended if you have coral that's receding is to frag it. And the reason this works is if you can get a healthy frag uh, away from the infected part, the healthy frag will often survive. Of course, that does 
rely on your coral colony being big enough that you can actually frag it because uh, you do need to keep a healthy distance between the infected part and the part that you're fragging. Um, obviously fragging itself is a uh, stressful thing for the coral to go through. So if it's also being attacked by bacteria, it's just not gonna survive. So all of their coral colonies survived the transport and uh, the date of the paper at least, they survived 28 months post collection uh, in their systems there. They did have some discussion at the end, which was interesting, things that they thought might be able to improve the, the collection and transport of these coral. Um, one thing that they pointed out is that the coral surface mucus, um, that mucus stuff that comes off when you irritate coral and is just sort of always on the coral in, in the wild and in our tanks, um, is important for the health of the, the coral. It has a whole biome just to itself that is beneficial to the coral while it's on, but if you take it off and put it in the water, it can actually start irritating the coral and uh, can lead to the death of the coral if, if you have too much of it in the water. I also thought that it was interesting. They suggested maybe it would be good to um, actually stress the coral more so than they did. Obviously collecting the coral and everything, it mucuses up quite a bit, but there are other papers out there that suggest that maybe like purposely stressing the coral and getting it to really produce a lot of mucus up front might actually be a good thing because then there's a lot less that it can produce during shipment. They didn't do this though. They thought it would be interesting to look at that in the future. So the overall goal of their study was to show that it is possible to collect coral in say Singapore and then study it in London and be successful at it and still have the coral reproduce in captivity. They found that all of the coral that they collected, remember it was collected just one month before the natural wild spawning time, they found that it all spawned in captivity as you would expect actually at the same time that would have been predicted for the wild. So in conclusion, they found that large gravid Acropora hyacinthus colonies can actually be transported long distances um, in their case for 34 hours uh, with no mortality and that they'll spawn on the same cycle as the wild counterparts. I have another video, uh, I'll link it up there, about actually spawning the coral. And this paper sort of naturally leads into the study on actually spawning the coral in captivity because this is the sort of the, the uh, not sequel, um, <laughs> um, the prequel to spawning the coral. Uh, the other paper is all about how they took care of the coral for the long time um, in captivity so that they could spawn it. So I hope this was interesting. Let me know what you thought in the comments. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and I will see you next week. Bye.